Well, hello, and thank you for asking me to address your institute. It's an honour to be asked, and it's also a pleasure to make contact again with Hassan. Hassan and I go back a long way. Uh, in fact, he asked me in 2015 to do a presentation in Istanbul, which was followed up by a visit to Iran. And uh, it was there that uh, he and another Iranian colleague were exceptionally generous to me in showing me around the wonderful country. I visited Tabriz and Ardabil and Shiraz and Tehran and some of the uh, amazing sites of uh, Candavan and, and Persepolis. And I have to say that I came away from my visit there thinking that the the people of Iran uh, are amongst the most generous and kind people uh, in the world. So it's, uh, uh, it's a, I guess, a, something that I willingly do uh, when I'm talking to uh, people that I consider to be um, very decent people. I did visit Iran again a second time in 2018 with my Iranian-born colleague, from the University of Queensland. And uh, again, I, um, I saw the wonderful sights of your country and uh, met so many people uh, who were so deeply impressive. Right, so let's get started. The, um, I'll provide a, an overview, first of all, that uh, I just want to, first of all, talk about an outline of the Anthropocene era. And I ask, should we worry? Uh, have we responded well as a planet? I then say, well, why wisdom? What's that got to do with it? I'll then look at pro-environmental behaviour from a sociological point of view and provide a fairly complex model of wisdom in pro-environmental behaviour. And then I'll finish with the results of a study that I conducted with some Indian colleagues a couple of years ago, in which we are now writing up for publication. So to get started, the world is geopolitically deeply unstable as we look at the events in Europe, the Middle East, North Africa, and of course the turmoil in the United States, in my own part of the globe, the rise of Chinese power and its assertion of sovereignty in parts of Southeast Asian uh, region is causing some concern amongst our neighbours to the north. However, all of this will count for very little if we do not act with great urgency to slow and even reverse the impact of climate change. Let us be blunt. We've entered a new geological era, the Anthropocene era. What the term Anthropocene means is suggested by the Greek Anthropos for human and Kene from Kenos, meaning new or recent, or specifically it means that for the first time in the history of the, the planet, human activity has been having a dominating influence on the natural world and the functioning of the Earth's system. More specifically, the human imprint on the global environment has now become so large and active that it rivals some of the great forces of nature in its impact on the functioning of the Earth's system. Its most recent origins lie in the industrialization in the 1800s by incorporating the use of fossil fuels. However, deforestation has also hugely contributed. Although Global scale human influence on the environment has been recognized since the 18, 1800s. The term Anthropocene was introduced about a decade ago and has become fairly widely used. As this diagram shows, uh, you can see a rapid development in the publication's use uh, of the term Anthropocene. So it's not a particularly uh, new term. It's been around for a little while and it's something that we need to take care of. 
So why should we worry about this new age? Or should we worry about this new age? And the answer is indeed we should. We should be very worried. A major impact of climate change and deforestation is the widespread extinction of animal and plant life. In fact, it has been labelled as the sixth major extinction. When you consider that the first major extinction, the Ordovician extinction, occurred 445 million years ago, and the most recent, the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction, occurred 66 million years ago, the enormity of this distinction is truly frightening. The rate of extinction is estimated at 100 to 1,000 times the normal background rate of natural extinction. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature has identified over 28,000 species as threatened with extinction. But this doesn't account for much larger taxonomic groups such as insects and fungi. The Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services 2019 report estimates that possibly one million animal and plant species are threatened with extinction. The other related impact is the loss of biodiversity. As habitats are lost, ecosystems can no longer support each other, and so there is a multiplier effect on species loss. So, has our planet responded with the needed urgency? If you could just have a brief look at this diagram, you can see that it's a logarithmic scale of years, and you can see how rapidly the growth has been in global warming. And what I want to point out to you is that the notion of a safe Anthropocene is can only be achieved if it's below 1.5 degrees. If it gets between two and four degrees, we are in serious trouble. And so the question there about a good Anthropocene is meant ironically, no, there is no such thing as a good Anthropocene if you have a two to four degree increase in global warming. Anything beyond that is simply catastrophic. The first major global wake-up call was the publication of Our Common Future by the Brundtland Commission in 1987. Emerging from this was the first of the COP or Conference of the Parties conferences hosted by the United Nations. The first COP was held in March 1995, and they've met every year with COP28 due in Qatar in December 2023. Frankly, the first 14 were relatively useless. Various reasons abound, including the power of fossil fuel industries and governments that depend on them, and disputes between developed and less developed countries about who bears the cost for the mess that we're now in, which of course is mostly caused by the West, and developed countries, including China, unwillingness to alter their lifestyles. And there was also the escape clause in the Brundtland Report, which is sustainable development, allowing people to pretend that they're doing something when they're not. This graph of my own country gives an idea of the poor performance of relatively rich countries in doing their job in reducing emissions. As you can see, that uh, if, uh, if we were to reduce to 450, which is the required amount to get to the, to the target of 28%, then our 2018 projections are way above it, way above. I am happy to say, however, that uh, last year, a new government replaced a very conservative government that didn't believe in climate change. And there are positive things happening, but still not fast enough.
So the point was that in 2015 in Paris, the COP21 conference, we had a major breakthrough because at this meeting, most countries signed up to limit Earth's temperature rise to 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial level. Almost all countries have submitted pledges to reduce their emissions over the next 10 to 15 years. The Paris Agreement notes that the current pollution and reduction targets are insufficient to meet the long-term goal and efforts will need to be increased. The most recent um, report from the International Energy Agency in 2022 showed a number of things. First of all, that global energy related CO2 emissions grew by 0.9% in 2022. Now, keeping in mind that 2020 and 2021, CO2 emissions reduced because of the massive effect of COVID on industry. Natural gas emissions fell by 1.6%, but coal emissions increased. Emissions from oil grew even more than emissions from coal, raising by 2.5%. 50% of that increase was coming from aviation. The performance by countries varies. Uh, China's emissions was relatively flat in 2022, but this is probably largely explained by their low economic uh, performance over the last couple of years. The EU achieved 2.5% reduction in CO2 emissions whereas the United States grew by 0.8%. In Asia's emerging market and developing economies, excluding China, they grew faster than any other group, which is definitely very worrying. So we might ask, what has wisdom got to do with it? Before beginning, let me say that I adopt a Western conception of wisdom, which has its roots in Aristotelian philosophy. However, I acknowledge the significance of other non-Western philosophical uh, traditions, not just by mere words. That is, I have collaborated with non-Western scholars to produce publications on wisdom. In 2016, I co-edited with three Indian colleagues a special issue of philosophy of management on various Indian wisdom traditions. And uh, in 2022, I co-authored an article entitled A Shia Islam Approach to Wisdom in Management with an Iranian scholar and an Iranian-born Australian academic. So... To return to where I said I'm coming from, namely the Aristotelian uh, tradition, we could say that wisdom is a vital feature of environmental studies for three reasons. It's founded on moral and intellectual virtues. It's directed to eudaimonic outcomes. Now, eudaimonic, again, is a Greek term, and it basically means human flourishing, taking the longer term. How does society and the planet in general um, perform? And the third reason is that wisdom takes a long-term perspective while considering um, short-term limitations. Wisdom, according to uh, Aristotle, is comprised of both intellectual and moral virtues. The intellectual virtues enable deliberation of problem solving He identifies scientific knowledge or episteme that is needed to be technically capable, techne. However, this is insufficient for wisdom. A third aspect is practical wisdom or phronesis, the capacity to deliberate, to deliberate rightly about what is good and advantageous for himself and what is conducive to the good life generally. Moral virtue, or arete, is a purpose of disposition governed by prudence to determine what is right and best. Moral virtues facilitate good actions. 
Thus, a morally virtuous person displays temperance in choosing between excess and deficiency. Being wise enables the capacity to discern the right rule in all spheres of feeling and conduct. I want to now make a link between philosophy, you know, the philosophy of wisdom, and sociology. Namely, what are the values and beliefs that underpin our attitudes to the environment? Now, I know this is a rather complicated um, diagram to be looking at. It Stern's values, beliefs, norm theory of environmentalism. And what he says is that there are basically three concerns, three values concerns that will determine our attitude to uh, the environment. Okay, so on the far left, we have values, the three values, egoistic, biospheric, and altruistic. And these help to shape a worldview. And from this worldview, we develop beliefs about the adverse consequences or the positive consequences. We then develop beliefs about our ability to reduce that threat. And then the norm level is a sense of obligation. We feel that it is right and proper to do something, to take action. But there is that leap between having a belief that one should take action and the actual behaviour itself, which could be activism or public sphere behaviour um, or behaviours in organisations. So very briefly, the three values are firstly egoistic, which is a negative value, which is positively um, correlated with self-enhancement and negatively correlated with self-transcendence. Biospheric um, values are negatively correlated with self-enhancement and altruistic and biospheric values are positively related to pro-environmental attitudes, intentions and values. So we can see this link between philosophy philosophy of values, and then the formation of beliefs, which is cognitive domain, and then into the area of norms, which is um, the values. So what then encourages pro-environmental behaviour? Okay, so if you just look at the the bottom diagram, first of all, you'll see that we have a very, very simple concept. Environmental concern and perceived risk leading to intention to act, leading to pro-environmental behaviour. And of course, we all know that the, the link from intention to act to actual action, pro-environmental behaviour, is actually quite weak. Okay, so... The dependent variable then is pro-environmental behaviour, which is defined as purposeful action that can reduce a negative impact on the environment. Typical pro-environmental behaviours would be waste management, such as recycling, reducing plastics, uh, the type of transport that we use, public versus private, the amount of air travel that we engage in, um, energy consumption, lower consumption levels in general, and the purchase of green products. Okay, so now this is a seriously spooky diagram, uh, and I don't wish to um, turn you off by it, but I just wanted to say to you that I've only gone through some of the variables that influence um, the link between environmental concern and perceived risk to intention to act to pro-environmental behaviour. It's a hugely complicated thing. 
And it's developed from um, the research that I've done, uh, or based on other people's research, not my own, of course. Um, so <laughs> you can you can see that at the top I have sitting like an island wisdom measures, uh, and I'm, my job is to try to find some link between wisdom. Um, and environmental concern, intention to act, and pro-environmental behaviour. But we do know that there is heaps and heaps of um, sociological um, theory to show that there are other things that we need to take into account, psychological variables, uh, demographic variables, political orientation. Um, and then we run into other things that, um, uh, moderating variables like uh, moral disengagement or belief in technology or even things like the hassle effect you know oh I'd like to do something but it's uh, it's just too much bother uh, things like self-efficacy and locus of control these are uh, moderating variables between intention to act and pro-environmental behaviour. So we'll just have a look at some of the variables that we know. These are only some of the variables that, we've, that we saw in that diagram. So let's have a look at some of these. In terms of demographic variables, we know that there is a reasonable but inconclusive um, link between uh, pro-environmental behaviour and age. But we, we do think that it does actually increase with age. Now, that might seem surprising when you, you might think that uh, pro-environmental behaviour, given that young people have longer to live on the planet, um, that they might be more upset than older people. But that doesn't seem to be the case. And there's been evidence from different parts of the world, in um, Spain and in India uh, and the EU, that suggests that uh, PEB actually increases with age. Uh, gender and pro-environmental behaviour, again, there is uh, not a lot of very compelling evidence. There is some uh, Indian evidence, but um, not very strong. However, a strong indicator of pro-environmental behaviour is uh, level of education. As your, as your education level increases, you are much more likely to be concerned about the environment and to take some action. However, this can also be attenuated or weakened by uh, political ideology. So you may be very strongly, um, uh, you may be highly educated, you totally understand the problem with the environment, but you think that people from uh, who are, involved in the environment or cons uh, conservation, that they're left wing or they're green, uh, they're anti-capitalist, uh, you know, they that could that sort of political ideology could attenuate um, pro-environmental behavior. And then finally, um, and then this might also be something of a surprise, there is a positive relationship between income and pro-environmental behavior. Uh, one might think that there is also a relationship between education and income. The higher your education is, the more likely you are to have a higher income job. So it's not entirely certain whether it's the income or the education that's the, the real link with pro-environmental behaviour. Um, the In terms of moderating variables, uh, knowledge is obviously very important. Uh, people who are very well informed regarding environmental issues are more willing to develop pro-environmental behaviour. Well, we think that that, <laughs> that would make sense. Um, however, on the negative side, there could be well-educated people, knowledgeable people, who think, oh, look, we're such a smart species. We're homo sapiens. We're very, we're very smart. We'll come up with something that will solve the problem. Um, nothing to worry about. So the technological solution approach uh, can be a negative moderating variable. The third one is self-efficacy. Um, 
this um, this uh, it has to do with your confidence in your ability to to exert control um, over your own behaviours and also over um, what's happening in society in general. So um, if you, you know, you might be, say, you know, quite um, very pro-environmental in terms of your behaviour, but you feel that, um, probably quite rightly, that unless the government does something, you know, in a big way, uh, it's not really going to solve the problem. And then finally, uh, there's perceived personal threat. If people actually perceive a personal threat rather than seeing it as a uh, as something external or vague or general, then they're much more likely to um, behave in an environmentally um, appropriate way. So, for example, people uh, who have experienced bushfires or floods or landslides um, personally, uh, they're more likely to to think, well, um, this this has this has affected me, and I've got to do something about it. Okay, so now I'm going to move to the the final section, where we have a look at the research study that um, I did with Ali Intazari my Iranian-born colleague uh, from the University of Queensland, uh, and um, with two colleagues from India. And um, so we uh, we did a survey, a uh, sample size of um, about 1,100. Uh, you would think that Australia with a population of 25 million might have had a much smaller sample than India with a population of 1.2 billion. Uh, nevertheless, it's uh, it's a it's a good sample size, a workable sample size. And so, our two questions were: uh, Does environmental self identity mediate the effect of wisdom on the intention to act? And does region moderate uh, the, the mediation effect? So. We. Of all those variables that I showed you on that previous slide, um, we broke it down to four variables. We did, in fact, um, survey a whole bunch of variables, which we are not reporting here, but we'll, we will come to them at another time. But the four we looked at here are pro-environmental behaviour, intention to act, uh, wisdom, where we used a 21-item scale because of its weighting towards self-transcendence, which we believe is a, a universal feature of wisdom. And then we just had a two-item environmental self-identity scale, um, which is I think of myself as a green consumer, or I think of myself who is very concerned with green issues on a one to five scale. So that were the that were the four variables uh, that we looked at. And so we wanted to see the relationship between um, wisdom and the intention to act, uh, and whether the um, the relationship was mediated by environmental self-identity and then uh, the the moderating effect of region, whether region uh, had any uh, impact. And this is what we found. So what we found was um, an indirect effect of wisdom on intention to act, which was significant. Um, so uh, uh, the mediated relationship, however, uh, is not a full mediation. It's partly mediated. So the relationship between wisdom and intention to act is still significant, but is weaker when environmental self-identity is added to the model. Okay, so, um, so this would suggest that environmental self-identity is a really important aspect of intention to act. Um, there was uh, a non-significant relationship between wisdom and environmental uh, self-identity, which is interesting. And there is there was no uh, significant relationship between country, Australia and India, and the relationship between wisdom and environmental self-identity 
which is interesting because it might suggest that these um, uh, these results are uh, universal. Mind you, we're only looking at two countries, but two fairly significantly different countries. So that was uh, that's just a, a um, uh, an outline of the results that we got uh, from our study. So I'll wrap up now. Um, the um, so what did we find from this that wisdom positively predicts both environmental self identity and intention to act. Indians scored higher on environmental self identity and slightly higher on intention to act. Um, Although they scored higher in general, the relationship between wisdom and both outcomes is the same strength. And also we see that environmental self-identity partially mediates the relationship between wisdom and intention to act. And finally, region does not moderate the mediation effect. So... Research questions. Research question one, does environmental self-identity mediate the effect of wisdom and intention to act? Yes, it does. And does region moderate the mediation effect? No, it doesn't. That is, wisdom works the same in both regions. So let's wrap this up now, ending where we began. If I could just make a few points. Um, in a practical sense, about what this all means in terms uh, of the enormous urgency with which we need to act. The environment is literally an existential issue. That is, it threatens our existence as a planet or as a species on the planet. We fail to understand its urgency. It cannot be solved by personal actions alone and governments must provide means for us to live properly, ending fossil fuel industries as quickly as possible is a major one uh, thing that would need to be done. But you can see how difficult that would be uh, in you know, Middle Eastern countries and the various OPEC countries and Venezuela and the US, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that are oil and coal producers. And Australia is one of the biggest coal producers in the world, by the way. Uh, providing infrastructure such as public transport, providing electric vehicle recharging stations, providing waste stations, recycling places, things like that. Industry must modify its practices to produce lower emissions. Uh, advanced countries have a responsibility to developing countries. It was basically our mess. Um, so we have a responsibility to clean it up. We need to reforest very, very quickly, and it's pleasing to see that the new government in Brazil is doing something about that. And of course, we need to protect biodiversity of all living things from single cells to mammals. So I'll end with a question for you. And before doing that, I'd just like to thank you again um, for inviting me to talk to you. It's been a privilege to speak to you. I wish I could be there. Uh, because Iran is a country that I really like. Uh, but uh, thank you once again for allowing me to speak. So I'll leave you with, with this question.